Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, we'll tell you how children's writer Dr. Seuss penned a guide to art history that was never published until now. We'll also introduce you to an artist painting modern Russia with crude oil. And while the rest of the world was reeling from the season finale of Game of Thrones, an army of designers and embroiderers was hard at work in France. We'll bring you what they came up with, but first. Reclaiming the city, Seoul Biennial of Architecture and Urbanism undertakes collective city making. Is this the real life or is this hyperrealism? We'll bring you the latest works of a prominent contemporary artist. Meet Leonardo Frigo. He's telling us how he's interpreted one of the greatest works of literature. According to the UN, 54% of the world's population now lives in metropolitan areas. In 30 years, it will go up to 86% in advanced countries. But as modern day cities are just marred by political and economic ambitions, how humane are the cities anymore? Is it possible to remain optimistic about the future of urban life? And is collective city making a utopia? These questions are all being tackled as part of the current edition of the Seoul Biennial of Architecture and Urbanism. Set across five locations in Seoul, the Biennial aims to address issues related to the formation of the cities across the globe. Titled Collective City, it aims to serve as a platform for discussion about how architecture, city and governance can work together to create more humane cities for the people by the people. Hosted by Seoul Metropolitan Government and organized and planned by Seoul Design Foundation, the biennial is conducted under the direction of Jae Yong Lim and Francisco Sennen. The biennial runs until November the 10th. Now, to tell us more about the 2019 edition of the Seoul Biennial of Architecture and Urbanism, co-director Francisco Sennen joins me. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. So, um, well, I read the press release and everything, so it seems like a very well-prepared, very well-thought international biennial to me. So, it begs the question, why is it in Seoul and what kind of a role is Seoul, the city, playing in this biennial? Yes, that's actually a very good question. Uh, Seoul, as you know, has been one of the fastest growing cities in the last decades, uh, set in a pace that is very almost unheard on in the rest of the world. And in the last maybe 10 years, that growth has slowed down and the city has had time to focus on the more qualitative aspects of what a city is about. So for decades, the main goal was to construct infrastructure, to build housing, to accommodate large-scale population. But in the last, let's say, 10 years, the, the attention has shifted to, let's say, a more qualitative aspect of it. So a few years ago, the city um, created what is called the city architect position. So that was the first recognition that architecture has a role to play in the construction of the public realm of the city. It's almost a natural extension of that, that the city wanted to become a partner uh, in an exchange of ideas, a network of ideas that are with cities around the world. So the Biennale becomes the kind of mechanism to engage with cities and practices and institutions around the world that are thinking how cities are changing today and how to make them better. So, so in 2017, we had the first uh, Biennale and this is the second one. And I mean, you focus in the Biennial on collective city making. That's how you phrase yeah. it. I know, of mm -hmm. course, we all know that cities have changed over the centuries, but since when are we yearning for a collective attitude, for a collective <laughs> space? Isn't it the way right. it should be already? Absolutely. You completely nail it down. Uh, cities started and historically aim to be collective spaces. In a way, it's the promise of the cities. We all come together with a purpose to achieve something, to negotiate our differences, to live together and to produce culture. And, to develop as, as human beings as a society. Uh, however, I think looking at the most recent conditions of the city, one begins to wonder 
if that's still the case. So there was a sense that we probably need to, there's an urgency. So in a way, the question is not so much what is collective city, but why? Why is it urgent today when we cities that are more unequal, more segregated, uh, public space has been commodified. So there are many challenges that cities are facing today by not being developed, let's say that collective character, but being developed more as real estate, uh, as market value. So this is a call to look around the world for people, institutions, governments that are trying to recover the city as a, as a collective space. Speaking of the cities around the world, do you think it's a bit of a generalization when we say cities are like this, cities are like that? I mean, is it even maybe a bit Eurocentric to say that? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that, of course, uh, a city, let me put it in a different way. One of the, the aims of this Biennale that I set up from the very start is to make it a global platform where cities from different parts of the world and geographies that are not normally recognized in Biennales uh, would be recognized and given uh, a space and a platform to speak from. Uh, we believe that some of the most interesting examples and experiments in urban design today are coming from cities in the global south. So clearly a city in Africa, a city in, in Europe or a city in India are facing very, very different challenges, are at different stages of, uh, of transformation. And part of the aim of the Biennale, or a very important aim of the Biennale, is to give a space where these examples, these experimentations, this research, these conditions are put side to side to be able to understand both the difference and their commonality so we can engage in a dialogue, a constructive dialogue. This is all very thought provoking. Great to talk to you, but unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. From dancers and musicians to tourists and local residents, Istiklal Street is home to some of Istanbul's most interesting characters. And they've certainly served as an inspiration to the city's artists and writers. Now an exhibition uses a touch of magic to honor the many faces seen on the sprawling boulevard. Showcase of Sena Arslan went to see how. Anything in life can be the subject of art. Even a random person who we might not think is that worthy of getting a sculpture. This exhibition works with these ideas. It's an extension of high art, low art debate. Abracadabra is Halil Altındere's latest exhibition at the Yapukredi Cultural Center one of Turkey's leading arts and cultural institutions. Altındere's show is featuring his latest 25 works. Most are hyper-realistic sculptures, and all of them are critical reflections on both today's art scene and everyday social struggle. I'm interested in revealing the differences between these two realities. The reality of seeing this famous character from the Istiklal Street called Paolo the Bard and seeing a sculpture of him in a gallery on the Istiklal Street. It's important to draw this difference as long as the viewer can also question their own reality. For example, take one of the sculptures on display here, the art lover. The man viewing the artwork becomes an artwork himself. Or take the security guard. He's normally responsible for the exhibit, but here, he becomes the exhibit. That's the kind of reality check I'm talking about. The kind of reality check Altundere mentions is about the contradictory realities we have and experience every day. Social identities, political orientations. How are we to survive under the political, cultural and economic conditions that impose these very impersonal categories and labels? And along with its attractive and popular influence on the viewers, hyperrealism creates a new and distinct dimension of reality for the artist. I like using the ordinary, mundane, everyday events and characters with an element of absurdity and play with the idea of reality and fiction. Altundere's earlier exhibition, Welcome to Homeland, reflected on the global refugee crisis. With the help of the absurd but also real-life characters, like a refugee astronaut, Altundere envisioned space where a refugee could seek shelter, a home. 
People read about what's going on in the world and hear about the realities of others on the news. However, they choose to disregard and neglect these realities. The artwork you see here make people face the reality and develop empathy to connect with the world. While Altındere highlights empathy, the importance of this exhibition for Yapı Kredi also serves a cause. We wanted to hold a contemporary art exhibition because it is a season of contemporary art in Istanbul. And we wanted it to be a fun exhibition, a celebration, a reason to keep our inner children alive, which is very important to us. That's no surprise, considering Yapu Kredi publication started its journey in 1945 with the launch of a children's magazine. And 75 years later, it's still making us feel curious and a little childish. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. Dante's Inferno is an allegorical masterpiece that's been retold by countless painters. Then there is Leonardo Frigo, who's taken this epic to a different kind of canvas. The Venetian has mixed his talents as both illustrator and musician, and has told the story of one man's descent into the underworld by drawing it across dozens of musical instruments. How exactly? Well, here's Frigo's explanation in his own words. My name is Leonardo Frigo, and I'm a London-based artist. I'm from Venice, Italy, and I mainly paint on string instruments. I started playing violin when I was 15 years old, and after a few months, I decided to remove the varnish, the original varnish from the violin. I decided to remove the original varnish and to paint it with black ink. When my violin teacher saw it, he decided to show it to other people and after a few months later, I had my first art exhibition. After high school, I moved to Venice and I studied art restoration. These studies helped me a lot to improve and to learn about new materials. Venice is the best place to be a young artist. I had a lot of opportunities to show my artworks and I did more than three art exhibitions every year. Every violin is inspired by a different story or biography. Currently, I'm working on a personal project of 33 violins and one cello. This project is inspired by Dante's Inferno. I spent more than one year to figure out the perfect uh, ink. I use, a, uh, I use a mix of five different inks because some inks are too liquid to use on the wooden surfaces. So I had to mix different types of inks with uh, varnish. To paint a violin takes between four and five weeks to paint and to finish one violin. I start from an unvarnished violin, I have to sketch all the illustration on a paper and after transfer them on the violin with the nib and the black ink. Uh, after that, when the violin is painted, I have to varnish it and set up all the strings and the finger sport and other pieces. So it's a long process and it takes between four and five weeks. Mainly, my violins are sold as art sculptures. Others are sold to professional violinists, so these violins are playable. In the past few years, I had exhibitions in Italy, Germany, France, England. Um, now that I'm working on this big project um, inspired by Dante's Inferno, in 2021 it will be the 700 years anniversary of Dante's death. I'm planning to finish my exhibition for that date and have an exhibition in Venice and Florence. I had the first part of this exhibition in London in Mayfair last March. When I was a teenager, I tried to find a way to combine my biggest passions and music and art. After some experiments, I found a way to combine them in a unique art piece that are my violins. Still to come on Showcase. What do you get if you mix a horse and artistry? The answer is a book by Dr. Seuss.
An artist takes a world commodity and challenges its real value on canvas. Winter is coming to France. We'll check out how HBO's much-celebrated fantasy drama has inspired embroideries. On the day of his death, we're celebrating the colourful legacy Dr. Seuss left behind. A new book has been released posthumously this month. And in typical Seuss fashion, it's about a horse guiding children in a museum. Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum is about a talking horse who takes his students through famous works of art. It's the seventh book by Seuss to be published after his death in 1991. The manuscript was found in a folder marked as Noble Failures, although the book is now a New York Times bestseller. If that's not reason enough for you to check out this new release, it also has some fun cameos by the Cat in the Hat and the Grinch. Now, let's turn to the person who brought the book to life, Andrew Joyner, the illustrator of Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today. So tell us, how come no one knew about this manuscript before? And uh, yeah, there was with some other sketches and things he'd been working on, and uh, he'd just obviously forgotten about it. But they think he actually drew it sometime in the 1950s, but then put it away in a box, and it wasn't uh, thought about until a few years ago. And also... An artistry guide for children must have been a hard sell at the time. Yeah, and look, I think it would have been really difficult to um, print as well. I think it would have been quite a challenge to get that printed um, just because of uh, it needed full-colour printing and needed to have actual artworks within the illustrations. There were, it was quite a complicated book, especially for the time. And um, these rough sketches were found in a folder named Noble Failures. Uh, by his widow. Why was it the name of the folder? Do you think it's a failure, this book? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think it's a failure at all. I can sort of see why he couldn't finish it at the time. He'd done a lot of the text, so most of the text was intact, but um, he uh, hadn't quite worked out the illustrations, really, and I guess that was the difficult part. Um, but I just, I loved the idea for the book, regardless of whether it was a Dr. Zeus book. I thought it was a great idea to sort of describe art history by looking at the way different artists have painted horses, like focusing on one subject. I mean, luckily, you were the one to complete that book. I was going to ask about that. How did that process go? I mean, did you try to resemble your style to his, or how did that work? Uh, I try, All I worked on was the illustration. So any text, any of the words were that were changed or were done by the editors at Random House. But as for the illustrations, um, I just really focused on doing my own style, but I think in a way I was trying to draw on the sort of natural influence of Dr. Zeus's work that was already in my style. Um, and maybe I tried to emphasize that a little. Um, I sort of wanted the illustrations, while they're in my own style, I did want them to be like a tribute or homage to Dr. Zeus's work. And would you say that it's a classic Dr. Seuss book or how does it fit in with his world? Uh, no, I'd say it's quite different to a lot of Dr. Zeus's books. It's one of his few non-rhyming books. I'm pretty sure it's uh, his only non-fiction book. So it's quite different. Again, that may be why he never finished it. It's very different to the work that we'd know from Dr. Zeus. Um, I think it still fits within his world because he was a very uh, creative and he was just interested in every aspect of life, I think, and especially in art. So... Um, uh, so I think it still fits within his sort of view of the world. But it is, as a book, it's quite different. I mean, this might sound like a bit of a silly question, but I'm just going to ask it. The main character, the horse, do you think we can see it as a metaphor for Dr. Seuss himself? Well, I'm very glad you picked up on that because I kind of tried to get, get that in there. So if you, in the very first few pages, you'll see a figure of Dr. Zeus uh, drawing in the corner and he's dressed very similarly to that horse uh, that guides the children through the book. I didn't want to make it too obvious, but I, thought, I think there is a bit of a connection between that horse that narrates and guides us through the museum and Dr. Zeus himself. And um, the Horse Museum opens up with a very heady question Art, what is it all about? Do we get a fresh perspective on art history here? Does Dr. Seuss present that? 
Uh, yeah, I think we are. I mean, I learned quite a bit about art uh, from looking. I discovered artists I didn't know uh, and things like that from looking at this book. I think it just um, helps, especially a child or someone new to looking at art, to just see the different styles of art in quite a clear way and to sort of see how there can be a connection between, say, a cave painting and something by Picasso or um, or even like a wire uh, sculpture by Alexander Calder. Okay, one more question. Do you think there are more Dr. Seuss manuscripts to be found? Uh, I, look, I don't know. Uh, I haven't been told. Look, he, like a lot of um, creative people, he always had ideas, and I'm sure there are lots of ideas scattered around. Like the University of California, San Diego collects has got all his material, like all his final art, all his sketches and things like that. And I'm sure amongst that, there are other bits and pieces which were never made into a book. The question is whether it's enough to make into a book. I think this definitely has, I might be biased, but I think this definitely had enough to become a book. But um, as for the other bits and pieces if that might exist, who knows? All right, Andrew Joyner, pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for having me on. Thanks so much. Oil is a massive global industry that dominates world economics and politics. Walls are photo over it. But in this instance, a Russian artist is using it as the medium in large-scale paintings to reveal what he calls the myths of oil. For 10 years, famous Moscow artist Nikolai Nasetkin has been jeopardizing his health to tell this story. Vivid dark textures and total black compositions. The artworks by Nikolai Nasetkin are made with wide strokes and focused on the material itself, crude oil. The Russian artist uses not only paint, but oil in his creations. For our country, it is bringing both wealth and power. And for us, for the people at the same time, this oil does not reach us. You can see large scale paintings, as well as art objects and videos from the artist's hometown village, where he found a huge scale of inspiration for his works. My birthplace is the village of Aleshki. You can see it on the drawing. I come from there, from Voronezh area. And you can see that the topic of relatives is present here. And it's also very important. The exhibition supervisor describes the Setkin's artworks as an attempt to show modern Russia and portray the significance of oil through history, despite the side effects on the artist's health. This is an exceptional case. The artist is working with crude oil as a painter. Sometimes he is risking his life. The vapors from the suspensions have negative health effects, and he is trying to depict the general categories with that material, family and kin. The exhibition can be seen until November the 11th in Moscow's new Tretyakov Gallery. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we leave, let's make one last stop in France's Normandy region, where an exhibition is paying tribute to Game of Thrones. Here's a chance to see the hit TV series in a nutshell, but not in a way you would quite expect. I'm Il Ferekitli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.
the Game of Thrones tapestry references the Bayeux tapestry stylistically in terms of some of the motifs that have been used and the way that the story unravels or unrolls in a linear fashion.